inbox a lot. Um, but my name is Ilsa May. I'm the career and outreach coordinator for the Department of Economics. So basically anything kind of careers related, exploring jobs or next steps um, after undergrad. So, you know, PhD falls under that um, or just gaining experience and kind of testing things out while you're in school. That's kind of like my focus area. And that looks like a lot of things. I do a lot of career advising, um, giving students feedback on resumes. You know, today I was helping a student with an interview prep. Another student um, got a job offer. And so I was talking about negotiations for salary. So no question is too big or too small, even if it's like, hey, I'm kind of interested in this econ thing. So what could I maybe do with it? Like students come in all the time. And they're like, I've heard that I should come to you because someone told me to, so I'm here. Now tell me what to do, right? Like, and that's okay too. So welcome, thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm really excited to hear from our amazing PhD students too, because I don't, I'm not an expert in the PhD world um, and they are becoming experts in the PhD world, right? Like that's the whole idea of a PhD is you're becoming an expert in something. At least that's my understanding of it. So um, happy to be here to, to learn from you all as well. Yeah, I can maybe start and introduce myself. So my name's Natalie. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And I'm a fourth year. I like forget sometimes how long it's been, but I'm a fourth year in the PhD program, which means I'm working on my dissertation. I'm all done with classes. All I have to do is uh, write a research project and graduate. So, um, and that'll probably take me a couple more years. Um, and so, but why I'm here today, so I'm also, we're all, the four of us are part of an organization called WIDE, which is Wisconsin for Inclusion and Diversity in Economics. Um, and so we're a grad student group who um, we have mostly in the past provided kind of like programming or workshops for graduate students um, to kind of reduce uh, or kind of help with information sharing or just like social networking um, for students, particularly from um, groups that maybe are underrepresented in economics. Um, and then this is our first time there's some interest in um, also reaching out to uh, undergrads. Like we were undergrads not that long ago. We know some of this stuff is kind of hard to figure out and it's helpful um, to have people to share. So that's um, I'm trying to think of this. Oh, so my research, I do macro labor research, mostly interested in uh, what happens to people when they lose their jobs. So. That's, I don't know, anyone else want to go next? I can, I can go next. Hey everyone, my name is Yobin. I'm a first year PhD student. So all I'm doing right now is coursework. Uh, and I'm from Nepal and I, I graduated. Uh, so I finished my undergrad in May, 2020. So in many sense, I still feel like an undergrad. So yeah, that was not too long ago. Yeah, that's basically it. It's great to have all of you here. I guess I can go next. Um, I'm Danny, I use he, him pronouns. I'm also a first year in the PhD program. Um, however, I graduated from my bachelor's in 2016. Uh, so I'm a little bit <laughs> further removed from it. Um, I'm originally from Washington State, but I got a one-year master's degree immediately after undergrad and then spent a few years in Baltimore, Maryland, working for the Federal Reserve uh, as a research assistant. And I'm planning on going on to study um, applied microeconomics, um, mostly in urban economics as a focus. <clears throat> Hey everyone, um, I'm Catherine. Um, I'm also a first year PhD student. Um, I'm originally from Hong Kong, but I did my undergrad um, in the US at Swarthmore College. Um, and after graduating in 2018, I worked for two years as a research assistant or some would call it a pre-doc program. <laughs> Those are becoming more and more popular these days. But yeah, anyway, um, so I'm two years out of undergrad and I'm happy to chat with anyone later on if you also have questions about like being an international student. I think that adds on an extra layer of complexity about your decisions with grad school. So yeah, happy to see everyone here as well. 
I will share, we have a presentation that has kind of um, a lot of like general base level information that we hope will be helpful. But if you ever have questions, um, feel free. I don't know if it's easiest to just try and you can just interrupt us or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, um, I ha we have the chat open um, and you can raise your hand or um, ask in there and we'll try and monitor that as well. So um, let me just share my screen. Okay, um, so I will start out um, with the first section. Um, so I think really like the first, before we even get into like what's happening with the PhD, like how do you apply, which we will cover. Um, I think the first question you kind of need to answer for yourself is, do you want to be a PhD economist? And um, I don't think I actually like officially answered this question for myself until I was like enrolling in graduate school because there's a lot of steps along the way that as you're preparing for the PhD, you also are kind of figuring out if this is something that you're actually interested in becoming um, for your career. So um, I thought it'd be helpful to start there. Um, this is from a uh, small, book called Getting a PhD in Economics, um, which I thought had some, when I was thinking about grad school, had some helpful uh, tips. Um, I think this is a pseudonym, but Stuart J. Hillman um, is the author. Um, but his kind of basic point is, and I did find this helpful, is you should think about the PhD is like a professional program to become an economist. So it's kind of like going to law school to become a lawyer. Um, and really that program is to teach you primarily to be like a research professor. Um, even if you don't necessarily end up becoming a research professor, that's kind of the skill set that the program is instilling in you. Um, and so kind of at a basic level for a good reason to like end up doing a PhD is because in your future career, you wanna be doing um, economic research. You have a lot of interesting questions. Um, and you maybe have some ideas about how to answer them, but really you um, want to know more. Um, so this is, and at the base level, this is kind of why I ended up deciding to do um, PhD. I think it's like a good program for people who are curious and maybe sometimes skeptical of other people's answers and want to be able to evaluate them for themselves or um, contribute to conversations um, seeking to find new answers to kind of some of the perennial like economic questions that we have. Um, but so kind of this is like looking at the end, like where when you were done with your PhD, if you decided, okay, I think I want to become an economist, where would you end up working? Um, so this, the American, one way to look at this is you can go to the American Economic Association's um, website. They post their job listings um, primarily in the fall. Uh, so this is from a few years ago um, when I was thinking about if I wanted to go to grad school. Um, and so this, there are a lot of international jobs. The AEA is more US focused, but just some of their job listings the majority of them um, are academic jobs that they list. And this might be restricted by like what field you do or what level of experience um, you have. But so there's full-time or like tenure track positions, um, but there's also sometimes they list jobs for more temporary academic jobs. Um, and even within academia, there's jobs that are maybe more research focused or more teaching focused. So there's kind of like a wide range of academic positions. Um, but outside of academia, there's also a lot of um, economists who end up working at places like government agencies, the Federal Reserve, um, Congressional Budget, Budget Office, uh, or even like state, state governments um, occasionally will hire economists. Um, and then more and more so, there's also um, people going to companies like Amazon or into consulting or doing like antitrust um, kind of uh, analysis. Um, and then there's also the option to go overseas. So, um, uh, and those, but the job types are similar just in other countries. 
Um, but other than that, like being an economist, like pays pretty well. Um, people, I wouldn't like if your ultimate goal, I think, is to make a lot of money. It's maybe not the most obvious way to do that. Um, but uh, you do typically have pretty high job stability, um, low unemployment, <laughs> even in downturns, and sometimes that like places like the Federal Reserve uh, during the financial crisis, they hired a lot because they needed a lot of hands on deck to kind of like figure out um, how to make things better. Um, and maybe one constraint um, is you, it's okay, maybe unlike being a doctor or um, some of these other, or teacher, other professions that are in kind of every location you can think about. Um, economists just don't work in every city. Not every city necessarily has uh, an economist. So um, there are some maybe like more locational constraints um, if that's important to you. Um, so just to kind of think about to um, as you're kind of starting to think about uh, if you want to be an economist, like what might inspire you is like an interest in a certain topic. Um, I think it, I, it took me a while to realize how like narrow um, some of these fields are. I, I think I looked at economists and thought they just knew like everything about all of the different subjects in economics, where um, really you eventually will kind of come to know a maybe smaller unit, um, but just kind of some of the topics. So I just went on the website for UW and this is like the first three rows of um, uh, what people are researching. And I, then I almost like ran out of space. So there's plenty more where this came from, but some of the topics uh, people are looking at are thinking about um, providing health insurance, uh, the racial wealth gap, wage inequality, um, job loss and displacement, uh, which is kind of what I look at. Um, thinking about technological change, like how do new technologies maybe replace workers or enhance the skills of other workers. Um, Non-parametric inference is econometrics. So um, there's kind of economists who often study more, maybe we would say like topics, but then there's also economists who develop tools for other economists, which is maybe like econometrics or theory. Um, but then we can also think about banking regulation and, you know, so there's just like a lot um, of different options. And, and I think part of the process is realizing what of these areas are of most interesting or most interesting to you. So these are kind of some of the questions um, that are potentially helpful to ask yourself when thinking um, if you want to become an economist. So thinking about what these questions are that economists have, um, does finding these questions interest you? Um, and I think also recognizing that there are certain questions that sometimes we think economists maybe know the answers to, but maybe maybe they don't um, completely like, so you can still, so something like the minimum wage, for instance, we have theory, we have a lot of papers, but um, we are updating that theory all the time. So even uh, topics that feel like they maybe have been done before, you can still contribute or, um, and that's kind of part of this process. Um, and then the other thing is just um, what kind of environments do economists work in? So this is where doing things um, like your professors are economists. So that's one environment, but you also might think about economists at a Federal Reserve. So I did an RA position there after undergrad. So that was like a completely new environment outside of academia. Um, and you can kind of think about if those are environments that seem places like you'd be successful. Um, or you can also think, look at those environments and think about, well, I really like that environment, but who else works there besides people who have PhDs? Um, what kind of jobs do they do? Uh, for me, a lot of the process of asking myself if I wanted to become an economist was also ruling out anything but an economist um, because it is uh, a lot of time to be in school and it can be worth it. But um, I think part of the process is ruling other things out as well. Um, and finally, I think like, why is the work that economists do important? Um, and is that the work that you find important? I think that ends up being, um, uh, yeah, I think that's a big one. And also just to eventually you wanna think about 
how has your career progressed? Like, how does that compare maybe to other fields? Does that match with what you think success looks like? Um, and one kind of good thing I think about economics is there is a little bit more of um, a clear path for what um, maybe like advancing look like, particularly for professors. You might think you become an assistant professor. And if you kind of do a certain level of work, you might become an associate professor. Um, but that can also be difficult too, because there is a narrow, a narrow, a narrower um, description of what success is. So I think it can be easier to know the rules, but maybe harder to um, succeed outside of those rules. So I think that's just none of this can maybe rule anything in or out, but these are all just kind of some of the questions that um, I ask myself uh, when thinking about that. So it's hard for me to see the, I don't know if there's anything in the chat or does anyone have any questions about deciding to become an economist before we move on to the next section? There haven't been any questions that have come in the chat so far, Natalie. I'll try to keep an eye on that for you. Okay. <laughs> I know it's hard to present and keep an eye on the chat at the same time. Yeah. Oh, Peter has a question. Um, so do you have a topic in mind already? Um, yeah, so I have a topic now. Um, and my topic has changed from when I applied to my PhD program. Um, so I would say um, in undergrad, I didn't have maybe like a very specific area of research I was interested in. Um, I was maybe more interested in, I'd say like development or international economics. And then that's what I worked on at the Federal Reserve Board. I was in their section focusing on um, international capital flows, just thinking about how money kind of circulates around the world. Um, and when I applied to grad school, um, that's what I thought I would end up doing. Um, and after my second year, I kind of realized I just didn't have as many questions in that area um, as I thought. And I was more interested in some of the more macro or labor topics. So it can um, change. Um, so I think a follow-up question for that, um, that Mike posted was what if you're interested in many of those areas and don't want to be limited to just one? Um, so I think being interested in a lot of areas is a really good place to start. Um, I think that's good. That means you have like a lot of potential interests. Um, eventually you, there's just a high bar to be advanced in many different subjects. So I think you don't usually restrict um, your ideas too much until uh, after the first year. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how the PhD program works, but, um, and uh, so I think it's like a good place to start. You Eventually you just kind of wanna be an expert in something that's part of the process. Um, but that doesn't mean like throughout your career you won't change like what subject fields that you um, are an expert in. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to look at some of these other, yeah, so Danny asked other, about remote work. Oh, I was gonna say other questions, um, that, that like a theme kind of seems to be like, what influenced your decision most to go to grad school or to get a PhD? Like, um, and when another student asked, asked that, and then another student said, I have no idea if I enjoy research. So how do I figure out if I'm going to like getting a PhD yeah. or the research after it? So kind of like what comes first, you know? Yeah. Like so we'll talk a little bit about the preparation steps and which including research. So maybe I'll defer that a little bit. Um, but just for me personally, um, I had an internship um, my uh, in college after my second year at a financial services company um, in New York. And I think at the time I thought, I mean, I maybe like some other econ majors, I thought uh, maybe finance would um, be interesting for me. And, um, and when I got there, I realized <laughs> someone told me if you really are interested in finance, you should read Warren Buffett's um, like annual report. And I like fell asleep reading it. I was like so bored. So, um, but when I was at that internship, I realized that there were other careers um, 
where people were doing more like research and asking any kind of like broader questions about like demographics or um and so that's really kind of uh in some ways like yeah meeting people so i think there's kind of like the process of doing research but you can also learn about this by talking to uh people in different careers and seeing like does that sound like a career that you're interested in networking is um, a little bit of a lower cost way than signing up yourself up for a job or something like that um but in the end probably what sealed it was working after undergrad at the Federal Reserve. I just realized it was an environment I really liked um, and I liked the questions and um, that was probably the biggest thing for me in the end. I don't know if anyone else, uh, Danny or Catherine or Yogan wanna jump in on any of those. Um, sure, I, I think, yeah, I think like Natalie said, um, just, one, like definitely trying to get as much research experience as possible because that will give you some exposure to what the day-to-day -day realities of doing economics research might look like. Um, and for me personally, I actually um, might represent some of you who like figured out that you want to do econ a little later. I figured out that I wanted to do maybe econ research, I think closer to when I was a junior and senior. So I ended up trying to kind of look for research opportunities with my undergrad professors um, and kind of building on that. Then I went on to apply for um, RA jobs after I graduated from um, college. And through that position, it really kind of solidified for me my own interest in doing econ research. So I think there's kind of the best way of figuring out whether you want to do it is um, trying it. Um, but I think there are also a lot of different pathways into choosing economics. Um, I think you don't necessarily, there's not just one way of going in. Um, I've heard of a lot of different stories of folks who have gone into private industry and done other forms of economics work before finally deciding that maybe they want to do e academic research. Um, so there's always different paths of ways of eliminating um, the potential areas of interest for yourself. Um, so there's not necessarily just one way either. Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk even more about this um, in a few slides. So um, maybe I'll just move, yeah. So um, this is kind of just like some background info. I think this is something too, when you're an undergrad, it's hard to know what the field looks like that you maybe are deciding to enter um, because your world is mostly like your department. Um, and so one part of that is like seeing what economists do in different jobs outside of academia, but also like maybe who are your classmates and that kind of thing. So this is just a chart that's showing um, from US institutions who, gra who graduated with uh, econ PhD. So this is from 2015 um, based on citizenship, race, Hispanic origin and um, gender. They just have a gender binary, um, but so I think one thing um, that's maybe different from your undergrad uh, potentially is that economics is a very international field once you get to the graduate level and beyond, um, even at US institutions. So I think it's about 50 to 60% typically of programs tend to be international students, which offers a lot of kind of different um, perspectives. Um, and then, um, but if we kind of think within um, the United States, it does tend to um, be predominantly uh, white. Um, and this is kind of like a perennial issue that comes up is that um, unfortunately students that come from uh, particularly like Hispanic, uh, Black, African American or Native American um, minorities tend to um, tend to be kind of few uh, in any department. Um, and, um, and the same kind of goes on the basis of gender. Um, and then we can also think about like maybe other um, instances. So kind of the reason I bring this up is I think, so for me, um, it was like quite jarring for me to graduate from undergrad and kind of realize like, oh my gosh, wow. Like there's a lot of dudes in economics. And I think of myself as having someone who like enjoys um, 
uh, in undergrad, it wasn't something I really ever thought about, like what would it mean to kind of be in a very like male dominated environment. Um, and, but I also have like other um, kind of identities or things that make that easier for me. So, but kind of like the questions, I think it's just like good to kind of realize this and also to, I think it's just important to say like, it's okay to make decisions based on like how you would feel in terms of acceptance based on like a certain identity. And um, and I don't think this is necessarily like talked as much about in terms of like choosing a PhD. Like usually people will be like, do you like econ? Do you like math? But I think at the end of the day too, you like have to decide like, do you feel supported with your colleagues and your friends? And um, so there's kind of, I kind of tried to think about this in two ways. Like, so thinking about like, what are, some of the things I can do, like maybe it's unfair that I have to do these things as an individual, um, but there are kind of things that you can do in terms of like thinking about jobs or programs where you'll be successful. Um, and also you might have to do a little bit more work to think about like, how do you find external support? So like the American Economics Association has kind of like committees for different um, groups. So like maybe if I don't have support within my department, I might look to um, those to try and seek um, some of that. And then I think at the end of the day, like I needed to be really sure that I liked economics and that this was something I would um, enjoy. Um, and I think it's, I think accepting the things you can't change doesn't mean they shouldn't change. Um, but it does, I think you do have to kind of, I think you can hope that things will get better. Um, but you also maybe have to be a bit more on the pragmatic side, I mean, cynical side. I don't know what the correct word is, but, um, but so these are kind of things that I had to think about and just have to, you kind of have to be honest with yourself. Like if you kind of face this adversity or you really felt like it was part of due to your identity, like would the work you were doing still compared to like maybe what you could do in another field, would that still kind of be satisfying to you? Um, and also like, do you think you would have enough support? Um, because like at the end of the day, I think like we're people first, like you want to make sure that you're um, a supported and like, well-rounded person. So, um, and not just like an economist who like suffers just for the sake of suffering. So um, yeah, this is, I, I don't know if this is helpful, but, um, maybe, um, but I think this is just something I didn't realize quite as much as an undergrad that um, I'm happy I thought about before going to grad school. Okay, so I know there's a lot of questions about, I don't know if there's anything else I can answer from the chat. There were some questions about like what for people who, um, were did work at the Federal Reserve um, as RAs like kind of what did they do and like how competitive was it to get into those yeah so maybe so more I broadly think, like um I think the next sections we should talk about that what well, we have a slide okay. on postdocs and stuff so um but yeah so I can move on to that yeah so how um so first Catherine is going to talk about just like what the PhD is and then in Danny's section when we're talking about how to prepare um, we'll cover that. Okay, so Catherine, can you, I can click on the thing, I think, for you. Yeah, that works. Um, so I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about how a PhD might prepare you for becoming um, an economist. Um, so you can think of a PhD program as kind of giving you, firstly, a foundation in the advanced um, theories, methods, and also understanding of the kind of current literature that's out there. So what are researchers currently working on? What problems are they wrestling with? Um, and second of all, it kind of, you'll get training from your um, professors and also upper year students um, and the program in general will help you develop the skills you need to answer the research question that you wanna answer. Um, and in general, the process tends to take five to six years. I think it used to take five years, but more and more so it's been leaning towards six years now. So it is definitely a long time commitment, which I think gives um, many <laughs> folks pause when they're considering a PhD. 
Um, and another kind of key aspect of it is, um, especially in the US, um, usually you'll have receive a stipend and some kind of tuition funding, um, either through your program or through government programs. Um, there are, are folks who also apply for kind of um, like external funding, like NSF fellowships and other sorts in order to support their um, way through a PhD program as well. Um, and then we can move on to the next slide. So um, in case you haven't, if you've done a little bit of research, you might've seen this already, but in case you haven't, um, the format generally goes this way. Like, so in the first year of your program, you're learning the very kind of foundational theory um, and also methods in um, economics. So that includes macroeconomics, microeconomics, and econometrics. Um, you also have kind of a math boot camp at the beginning of um, the uh, like summer slash fall quarter. Um, and that generally covers like real analysis, a little bit of linear algebra as well. Um, and that kind of gives you what you, the math background or the very minimum math background you might need in order to um, be kind of understanding concepts in the other classes. Um, and then the first year usually ends with a qualifying exam that kind of tests you on your understanding of the material from macroeconomics and micro. Um, and then once you have finished your first year in kind of foundational um, topics, um, in the second year, you move on to um, choosing courses that you think might be in your fields of interest. Um, so it and this depends on um, like the fields that are possible in each program usually depends on the professors that are at particular universities as well. Um, and it might vary from school to school. So at UW, I pulled up the list of topics that we have. Um, so this is not generalizable to all programs, obviously, um, but we have econometrics, industrial organization, international economics, labor economics, macroeconomics, micro theory, and public economics. Um, and these hopefully through the second year, you'll develop a better idea of what topics you enjoy and what topics you might not enjoy. And I think this is also, I obviously in my first year science, this is all things that I've heard from other folks, but um, you tend to kind of eliminate out programs that you think you thought you were interested in, but you realize, oh, maybe I don't really wanna do this after all. And you might discover something else that you're actually interested in. Um, and then from third year onwards, you start developing your own research. Um, and usually in this case, you'll be working with your faculty mentors um, and also potentially with um, your fellow graduate students to um, develop your own research idea. And sometimes it also involves creating your own econometric tools um, in order to develop your own research. Um, and if I've missed anything, Natalie, please jump in. <laughs> um, Natalie is the one who's kind of further along the process, so. No, you got it. Um, one thing Il Ilsa just mentioned, so it is true that, so with the qualifying exams and, or sometimes people start the PhD and either decide that they don't want to finish it or um, sometimes maybe didn't show enough progress. Um, it's becoming less common to be like weeded out from um, your program. Although some kind of varies across departments. Um, so typically in that case, you would graduate with a master's degree. Um, hopefully it's not something to like worry about too much at this point, um, but just to kind of mention that, um, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to provide some details about um, how you can prepare for a PhD program. Um, to start, the general idea of what schools are looking for in the admissions process is um, some combination of your research potential, your ability um, in the subject, uh, you know, both in terms of research, but also they, it's really bad for PhD programs if they admit students who, you know, aren't able to make it through the first couple of years because they're typically funded. And so, that this is kind of the content aptitude is partially their um, 
you know, looking at for signals that you'll be able to make it through the first couple of years to avoid that. Um, and then there's this kind of um, enigmatic other, which we don't, most people don't formally include in um, their descriptions of how to get into a good program is just pure luck. So, um, you know, you, for each of these things, there are, um, there's advice that, you know, I'm about to give and that a lot of the different people will give you is, you know, doing research, maybe either as an undergrad or, you know, doing a pre-doc or both, getting a good GPA, taking math courses, coming from a good undergraduate program. Um, but then even after all of that, there is an element of just sheer randomization. <laughs> um, you would, when most students, I, I partic I had this experience and most people I know had this one as well, um, will apply to the top X number of programs and then they'll find that they get into some programs that are very highly ranked and then other programs that are ranked much lower will reject them and there's just like kind of a random element to it based on who's on the the admissions committee um you know what type of signals they read from you um so kind of to start to formalize it the research potential what ways that you can signal your research potential is having a research assistantship which i'm going to go into detail on on the next slide um, performing undergraduate research, uh, which has its benefits not just in signaling, but also in making sure that you know you want to go to a P get a PhD program. And then if you learn that you don't want to go into a PhD program, um, undergraduate research tends to be useful in a lot of other fields as well. Uh, if you're going into policy or political science for, in academia, um, a lot of those research skills um, work in, in either field, or if you're going into journalism, they tend to expect a degree of, you know, data uh, analysis and um, skills. If you, uh, there, there are a lot of different fields where it would work. Law is another great example. Um, and then finally, uh, publications, which tend to usually come either from a thesis or from work with, with professors. Um, and then content aptitude comes from, uh, is usually measured using your GPA, the, the extent to which you've taken math and economics coursework, um, and then whether you take a GRE, and then a master's degree, which um, typically is mostly if you get one from outside of the US, most US master's degrees are terminal. They are meant to, you know, for students who are going to get a, PA, get a master's degree and then go into the workforce. Um, so those tend to not help very much uh, in get, trying to get a PhD in the US, but if you get a PhD in um, the UK, or for me, I got mine in Canada, um, that will tend to help you because those are um, in those countries, um, a master's is, is intended to be a step toward a PhD. And so they are actually preparing their students to go and get a PhD. Um, and in those cases, it actually tends to be cheaper than a US PhD, even with the international tuition, um, especially if you can get like a um, graduate fellowship that are intended for international students. Um, and then finally, the other steps are your institution reputation, um, who your recommenders are. There is a degree of elitism in, in economic academia, as there is in all of academia. Um, this is a hurdle and not a barrier. Um, you, I went from a, came from an undergraduate school that most people have never heard of and that wasn't definitely helping me, but I was able to get to Wisconsin. <laughs> um, and you're coming from Wisconsin, which is a very good um, school for economics. Um, and then whether you get an NSF grant or, you know, other potential activities. Um, and I, I can't really speak to those specifically. <laughs> if anybody else has any ideas, feel free to jump in. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, on this, these are kind of a lot of different details that basically nobody can um, cover all bases. And so it's helpful to be to really recognize where your weaknesses are and either try to you know, minimize the extent to which there are weaknesses for you, you know, or kind of offset them with places where you have greater strength. Um, 
So for me, I had a lot of research opportunities and I was and um, had taken a lot of math classes, but I also recognized that uh, my GRE score wasn't super great <laughs> and my undergraduate school wasn't wasn't recognized very well. And so I tried to get a master's degree and then a, a research assistantship so that I could kind of fill in those gaps. Um, and then uh, for research, um, you even just doing a thesis signals that you are interested in, it, even if it's not a thesis that you're able to publish or anything like that, it shows that um, you're interested in doing research, you're willing to put a lot of time and energy into it. Um, and then finally with the GRE, um, it, the recommended like kind of baseline threshold is 165 or the 90th percentile, which changes year to year. Um, in general, the uh, verbal and analytic sections can only hurt you rather than help you. Um, so if you get a very low score on the analytical or the verbal, that's a, a negative signal, but getting a very high score on them is not necessarily a positive signal. Um, it's just kind of neutral. Okay, and then for the jobs before the PhD, um, this is the something that I uh, am the most enthusiastic about. <laughs> I spent three years as a Federal Reserve Research Assistant um, and I couldn't imagine uh, having gotten a PhD without it. Um, I worked for the Federal Reserve, as I'd mentioned before, um, but there are other institutions, think tanks in Washington, D.C. tend to offer these. Um, there are also individual, like professors with a lot of funding will hire a full-time RA. Um, the NBER posts most of these, um, put, we'll, we'll just post things that you can like apply to individually. These are beneficial, not just because they help you prepare, but also um, this is something that I think is more or less unique to economics, um, is if you're a student who is you know funding their way through school undergrad independently and is going to be more or less financially independent in graduate school this is a way that helps get you into a good program but also gives you kind of a some financial stability for a few years before you go on um, at least the federal reserve pays very well um, and then for applying for these i saw um, a few students who were asking if they were competitive these are very competitive. Um, however, if you have done some undergraduate research, that will help you be competitive. And then if you have any coding experience, so in R, MATLAB, or Stata, or you know, anything more advanced like Python, um, that is very that like makes you extremely competitive for these because most undergraduates aren't exposed to that. Um, and these, there are a lot of opportunities to learn that. Um, and for one thing, you can more or less learn it alone. Um, if you, for example, just found a data set online that you are interested in, um, you can then find all resource, a bunch of different resources on Google for how to load it, how to make graphs with it. And if you have a goal, then you can basically type your question of how do I X <laughs> and then figure out how to um, do that in code and then, that makes you extremely competitive for research assistant uh, assistantships like this. Um, you can also go to ILSA for resources about how to find those. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, the could, the con to this is, you know, PhD is already a long time, and so if you spend three years in an RA ship, you're, you know, in school well into your thirties. Um, and then. I, I guess the last thing I'll mention on this that I had kind of is on the slides here, but I hadn't mentioned is um, this is also a good opportunity if you didn't have a have a chance to take real analysis or other math classes to kind of um, most of these programs will pay tuition for you to just go and take you know one class at a time um, if you want to take the other uh, take some courses for um, helping get into a PhD program. Yeah, I know, I know there were a lot of questions earlier about this, so um, 
I guess if we you we didn't answer your question that you had asked in the chat earlier, if you just want to put it back in or if there's anything new that came up, because it seemed like there is a lot of questions about these um, RA positions after undergrad. I had one question. Um, oh, sorry, Catherine. Um, oh, no, I was just going to mention the question Alicia uh, posted, but go ahead. So I work with students a lot who are applying for um, yeah, like RA positions and some of these students I see like, you know, they've done research with faculty and they have a good GPA and like I'm sometimes racking my brain of like, why aren't like maybe they're getting interviews, but they're not getting these, you know, coveted positions because there's maybe not a ton of them. So I see that you have like the common options on here. Um, are there other things like thinking of your peers um, or even like faculty? Are there other do people ever go and do something that's non-research related and then end up getting a PhD? Are there other routes that students can kind of look into? Um, and, I, I, and not that I'm putting all of those answers on you, but I'm just wanting to bring that up for um, discussion sake. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, I mean, if this doesn't work out, like I think a lot of, if this is still your goal, like there's ways if you're working in maybe more, just like a private company that's doing more, that's still kind of econ related, um, that could be an option. Um, I mean, I know like, like some people overseas had to do like military service. So there's like other reasons, you know, you know, taking a few years to do something separate doesn't necessarily maybe pushes back your clock, but, um, yeah. I was just going to say, there were also a few folks who work in consulting or in insurance. Yeah, consulting. It, those are both common. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I just add, I mean, I think this is something might be obvious, but having been on one side of applying and then also been an RA where my professor was hiring um, RAs, it just happened. A lot of these programs, pre-doc or RA programs. Oh, sorry, one second. Um, can you hear me? Okay, um, so I think there are more and more pre-doc or RA programs these days, but at the same time, um, there are just a lot of very qualified candidates applying. So sometimes it's just like, there's one kind of characteristic that the professor was really drawn to for a particular RA, and then they really like that person. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that other folks who didn't get the job weren't as qualified, but it's just kind of, the idiosyncrasies. So I would say definitely apply to as many as possible. Um, and I think related to that, Alicia had a question about um, if you're an undergrad who wants to do research but is nervous about how to start a conversation with a professor, um, especially since uh, the idea of research is pretty new to you. Um, so I think as Danny and also Natalie mentioned, um, having undergrad research experience is not only helpful for yourself to figure out whether you like doing research, but also for if you apply to um, RA jobs, but also just econ related jobs. Um, I think definitely um, try not to be shy. I, that's not a very good kind of advice, but I guess what I want to say is I personally was very critical of myself when I was an undergrad about, oh, like, you know, I don't think I'm so qualified. Like, I don't think I'll really be able to help my professor do this research. And so I kind of waited until I was a se senior when I reached out to a professor. Um, but in reality, I think the expectation for an undergrad, like most of the time, professors really just want to give you the opportunity to develop your research skills. It isn't necessarily, they don't really expect you, at least in my understanding, they don't expect you to like churn out um, like high quality tables and research right off the bat. Um, so I would say kind of don't feel like you have to achieve a certain level of like having taken many classes or like learned how to code fluently in Python before you reach out to a professor. Um, definitely reach out as early as possible. And if they say, oh, maybe you should take this class and then come back to me, then you'll have an idea of what you might need to um, learn. But most of the time I've learned that professors are also pretty amenable to working with you while you are still learning how to code in Stata or R and they might kind of give you some pointers here and there too. So I guess TLDR is um, ask early, try not to doubt yourself too much um, because especially when you're an undergrad, this is an opportunity for you to kind of develop your own skill set as well. 
Yeah, I, I guess I'll just, I mean, I think the first time I did research was like in a class where a research question was like, a, it was like more of like a research course. So I think that's, I think that if that's your first, that's maybe the lowest risk way. You don't even have to reach out to like a specific professor to enroll in a class that has a research component. Um, so, um, okay, so, so we have- I, I just wanted to add something to that. So I was an undergrad who was kind of, who wanted to know about research, but was nervous approaching professors. So the way that at least I started out was going to professors office hours. And then many professors are very, welcoming so yeah I, I i basically started out by asking even the most simplest questions about their research and and trying to figure out if they have opportunities available so i think when you're yeah starting out that could be one of the ways to do that so uh, with any e e econ courses that you're taking just reach out to the professor uh, to just ask them to see what they are working on and to check to see if you might be interested in that as well. And then that could take the conversation forward. So yeah, it just uh, starts with small steps. Um, okay, so we have, it's about five minutes to 3.30. So the last um, section is kind of, you figured out you want to go to grad school, you've prepared. Um, and then how do you apply? But so Yoga might go through some of this. I don't, since there's only five minutes left, um, I think maybe if there's, maybe we could just tailor it to questions people have about applying or like last minute questions. Um, or if there's not any specific questions, then Yoga can just kind of cover what he can cover in five minutes. Yeah. I think the most important thing might be the timeline and we can just add on to different questions that may come from this. So most, most programs, they have their deadlines on, on December. So if you're applying to multiple programs, you're gonna be busy through the month of December up to maybe early January uh, with these application deadlines. And in the year that you're planning to apply, you kind of at least want to have a few things done by the end of the summer of that year. Uh, one would be to take the GRE so that even if you don't do as well as expected, you still have some time to retake it again if you want to do that again. The other is to kind of make a tentative program list about what programs you might be interested in. And then uh, uh, it does not need to be final, but it should at least give you an idea uh, um, about where you might apply to. So a lot of that research in choosing places needs to uh, yeah, happen ideally before then. And another is to approach your recommenders uh, by the end of the summer as well, because especially university faculty, they are really busy during the semesters. So by approaching them at the end of the summer, you kind of signal that uh, kind of like an early bird advantage as well, but also you give them plenty of time to, uh, uh, to plan their time so that they can put some time aside to write the letter for you. So that's also one thing to do by then. And the other is to, yeah, basically have some research output. Ideally, the summer before you apply, you're engaged in some economic research, but it's not, but yeah, research is a continuous process. So by the end of the summer, you also want to kind of organize everything you have done into things that you can write in your application to supplement your application. So kind of have those things ready by then. Usually August, we've said that to enroll in any math classes, I think we have not, understated the importance of taking advanced math classes. It's a very big signaling tool in economic admissions. So ideally uh, you take as many math courses as you can to signal your competence. Uh, late October, there are a few things due, especially if you have uh, external fellowships, their applications might be due. So the NFS GRFP, the Graduate Research Fellowship Program is uh, one of the main ones, which is generally due in late October. You'd also by this time want to finalize your program list, all the list of places that you want to apply to, uh, start their applications. So for each of those programs that you want to apply to, there's no common application. So you'd have to kind of I don't know, make an account and register in different portals and then start processes there and also start sending your transcript and GRE score reports to these programs that you are going to apply to. So the December and January is going to be where you'll actually lose those applications. And after that, 
well, after that, yeah, there might be a bit of nervous waiting. Usually, uh, programs get back to you around mid to late February, even up till mid March. And uh, if you get admitted to one or more than one programs, the deadline to make your decision is by April 15th. And between that time, usually programs also have a visit day or an admit day uh, in which they invite uh, applicants who they have accepted to their program to take a look around for a day or two to their uh, to the university campuses as well. So that's basically the application timeline. Does anyone have any question regarding that? Because if not, maybe we should at least uh, do the application components part so that, so the next slide after this maybe, yeah. Yeah, so this is just some ideas for how to figure out what schools you might apply to. Um, yeah, which one did you, this yeah. one? Okay. Yeah. At least in the last one, the key thing is that ranking is not uh, all of it. So you'd want to judge a program by other metrics as well. So something like the reputation of that program by talking to uh, current students or recent alumni and looking at what the faculty in those programs are working on might be a good way to inform your decision. So yeah, let's look at some application components. Uh, most of these, so there are a few things that are common to all applications, right? So the standard info, personal info, contact info, all these things that are uh, common to all of them. There's also something called a personal statement or a statement of purpose, which is like basically an extended cover letter of why you'd be a good fit for the program and why you're interested in it. So you kind of inform that by providing details on your qualifications, maybe your research experience, your research interests, and so on. Um, you'd also likely be required to provide a resume uh, and official transcripts and GRE scores. So these are common across all programs. Now, some programs ask you for more things, such as a textbook list of uh, well, basically a textbook that you used in each of the econ and math courses that you took. So and not every, yeah, I think very few programs do this, but still some do. So yeah, yeah, that can be a bit tedious. Also an additional list for all the econ and math courses that you've taken. So that's also, I think even U UW-Madison requires that. So uh, that's also somewhat common. Uh, some programs ask for a personal history or a diversity statement. So another essay that's a bit more personal in nature compared to the statement of purpose. And also some ask for writing samples, anything that you've worked on that you'd want to submit. These are usually 20 to 25 pages. Some could be even shorter, but yeah. And I think some places have it as an optional thing, but usually when it's optional, it's good to provide one. Uh, and if you're an international student, so usually if you're an international student at an American institution, you are granted a TOEFL waiver, but still you'll need to make sure to uh, at least uh, inform, inform, or there might be some place in the application where you can say that oh, I'm an international student in the US. If there is not that option, then you need to email the admissions office to signify that. Otherwise they'll expect you to provide your TOEFL scores and it can, get a bit messy with the whole. So yeah, there's that uncertainty about whether they'll consider application or not if you fail to do that sometimes. So there's something to look at. Let's see. Hey, yeah. um, I just had a few. So um, Ilsa, someone had asked about the slides. Is there like a list? Uh, was there like a registration? Is she still here? Okay. Um, yes, is there I'm still a, here. <laughs> a registration list that we'll be able to send this out to? Yes, if you registered um, for the event, which you, I assume you did if you were here right now, um, I can send out a list of, I guess we could send out this recording too, if we yeah, think that that's helpful. Um, so we can yeah, send out a recording and a list of the slides if you all are okay with that. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, and the other, so I think most, I recognize a lot of people's names, but if you still wanted to sign up, um, if you still like have a lot of questions, um, we're doing some like one on one sessions with the other PhD students. Um, and if you are interested in that, it'll just be easiest if you just email me directly. I'll just put my name in the chat. 
there's still a few slots left for that. Um, yeah, well, hopefully this was, I mean, if we get like, there's only a few faces, like a thumbs up, like we're, how helpful do we get for this? Okay, good. Um, and so if there's any final questions, I can stick around for a little bit. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thanks all for joining. And I hope